misconception, noun, a view or opinion that is incorrect because it is based on faulty thinking, understanding, or miscommunication. Brand taint, noun, an undesirable quality which ruins the status or reputation of a brand. Iconic, adjective, not relatable, not a personality, not even remotely a character. Superman is plagued by conflicted and inconsistent canon, explanation, storytelling, branding, marketing, and adaptations. Such a plague has spawned innumerable misconceptions and questions about Superman. Let us review a few, shall we? Overpowered. Where do his powers come from? No weaknesses. Isn't he bisexual now? God. He can breathe in space and underwater, right? Republican. If his people had powers, then why did they not fly off their planet? Product of a bygone era. Yes, dear listener, these are actual misconceptions and questions I've often encountered from both casual and lifelong fans. Here is a question of my own. Where did Superman go wrong? To understand how to best write Superman, we must first journey back to the beginning and see what went wrong. The Platinum Age was born in dime novels and pulp magazines. Heroes like the Scarlet Pimpernel, Sherlock Holmes, Tarzan, Zorro, Doc Savage, The Shadow, Conan, The Phantom, and John Carter had fairly defined characterization, canon, and branding. Platinum Age heroes pioneered secret identities, calling cards secret layers, and powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. And then, a new age dawned. The Golden Age was born in comic books. Gimmicks trumped characterization, canon, and branding. Personalities were usually bland. Origins could be irrational. Canon was inconsistent. Costumes, powers, and locations were ever-evolving. Such dissonance can best be illustrated with Superman. On the one hand, Superman was the culmination of the Platinum Age. Like the Scarlet Pimpernel, Superman had a secret identity. Like Doc Savage, Superman also had a fortress of solitude, not to mention the name Clark. Like the Phantom, Superman also had an insignia, just not on a belt. Superman's surname, Kent, was identical to the Shadow's original name, Kent Allard. And, like Zorro, Superman's secret identity was also a milquetoast persona. Finally, Superman's original powers were like those of John Carter, only in reverse. On the other hand, Superman was the model for the Golden Age. After Superman, heroes had to have origin stories, chest insignias, love interests, weaknesses, multi-genre adventures, and of course, be referred to not as heroes, but as super heroes. Superman was an infant refugee of the doomed world of Krypton. He landed on Earth, was found by a farm couple, raised in an orphanage, and became a reporter. At first, Superman really only had two superpowers, strength and toughness. The strength enabled him to leap one-eighth of a mile and run as fast as a car. His toughness was limited only by bursting artillery shells. His powers were caused by Krypton having been a higher gravity world. The Superman radio show would add kryptonite as Superman's most famous weakness. Superman was a social justice crusader. His convictions were intense. A reporter by trade, a costumed hero by cause. Superman was a hero in both public and private life. Superheroes were all the rage. To keep up with competition, Superman would be written with additional powers, prompting one of the earliest series of retcons in comics. To explain these new powers, new explanations were required. In addition, Superman's brand was expanded to further confront the competition. As Superman's powers became numerous, his abilities were now caused by Earth's yellow sunlight. In addition, in order to snatch the audience of the more popular Captain Marvel, the Superman brand would expand to include tales of when Superman was Superboy. But Superman became a superhero as an adult, right? 
The Silver Age was born from the ashes of the Golden Age. During the Silver Age, DC revitalized its superhero comics. A new brand of Superman became the standard model in this era. The Superman of the Silver Age lived in the universe of Earth-1. Superman was an infant refugee from the doomed world of Krypton. He landed on Earth, was raised by a farm couple, adventured as a teen hero, became a reporter, and grew up to be an adult hero. His powers were caused by Earth's yellow sunlight. Although gravity would be mentioned, it was often cited as a secondary power source of really no importance. The weaknesses of this Superman included kryptonite, green, red, gold, jeweled, magic, and red sunlight. More often than not, this Superman utilized cleverness and creativity to overcome obstacles. Superman was essentially America's dad. He was depicted as a professional superhero since his teenage years. It was during his teenage years that he would meet the time-traveling Legion of Superheroes. While visiting the Legion's future, he learned that his exploits would eventually make Earth the Ellis Island of the cosmos. Meanwhile, the Golden Age of Superman would be considered as being from the universe of Earth 2. Seems streamlined and simple, right? Right? The Silver Age is often seen as an era of loony, irrational, and downright insane storytelling. Just ask Sasha. Indeed, the Silver Age is often regarded as why comic books are not taken seriously by the mainstream. Despite modern comics having accumulated numerous intellectual and artistic accomplishments, the Silver Age continues to cast a very long and loony shadow. And it's Superman on whom that shadow casts the darkest. The Silver Age stories of Earth-1 Superman are, well, what is the word? Oh, I think I remember it now. WTF. For more on how WTF these stories were, go check out Sasha's channel, Casually Comics. I'm sure she has a playlist. For our purposes here, we now look at how WTF Superman's powers became during the Silver Age. Here are Superman's canonical powers. Heat vision, telescope vision, x-ray vision, strength, and vulnerability, flight, speed, freeze breath, and hearing. However, one-off gimmicks, adaptations, and inconsistent writing has confused both casual and lifelong fans alike. During the Silver Age, Superman had adventures wherein he would be altered to exhibit some new but temporary power. Here's a short list of those one-off abilities. Translation, eidetic memory, loud voice, muscle folding to change his face, telepathy, amnesia kiss, mind control, super smell, launching mini supermen from his body, ventriloquism, well, isn't that more like a talent than an actual power? Oh, and my favorite one, rainbow rays. Well, at least we can count on Superman's strength, speed, and invulnerability always being consistent, right? Oh, right? Sometimes contradictions go unnoticed. Is Bizarro a goofball or a villain? Is Lex Luthor a Smallville native or a Metropolis native? Is Metropolis on the East Coast or in the Midwest? If a contradiction goes unnoticed, Fans experience no roadblock, speed bump, or detour when driving into a character. But for Superman himself, certain contradictions are indeed noticed. And the roadblocks, speed bumps, and detours are numerous. Are his powers caused by gravity, or yellow sunlight, or Zack Snyder? Was he or was he not Superboy prior to becoming Superman? Are Jonathan and Martha Kent dead or alive? Is the Fortress of Solitude a bunker with a key, a crystal palace, or an ice cave? Is there or is there not a variety of kryptonite? Is the chest symbol, the sigil for the House of L, the motto for the Kryptonian people, or an original design by Martha Kent? Was his childhood isolating or idyllic? Did he have powers immediately when under yellow sunlight or gradually when under yellow sunlight? Was he a member of the Legion of Superheroes or not? The Bronze Age was born when the Silver Age grew up, like an adult forced to reckon with misspent youth. The Bronze Age was forced to reckon with its Silver Age's past. In the Bronze Age, the Earth-1 Superman waged a never-ending battle to step out of the shadow of the Silver Age. But by the mid-80s, 
this never-ending battle was a losing one. In 1985, DC published Crisis on Infinite Earths, a miniseries that rebooted its canon. In this new canon, characters were given new origin stories while retaining the rest of their history. But in a few cases, characters had canons wiped clean completely. In 1986, John Byrne would be tasked by DC to give Superman a makeover. Gone was the Kal-El that was born on Krypton. Gone was the isolation caused by his superpowers. Gone was the early career as Superboy. And gone was Superman caring about his Kryptonian heritage. Superman was now born on Earth from an artificial womb launched from the doomed world of Krypton. Clark Kent experienced a lifehood filled with school sports and popularity. The Legion would never inspire him to ensure Earth would avoid Krypton's fate. Long-term exposure under yellow sunlight would eventually cause superpowers. Clark would regard these powers as initially ruining his life. The Kents would remain alive beyond his youth. Lex Luthor would become a criminal kingpin. The Phantom Zone was unnecessary. Bizarro was a series of disposable clones. In addition, Bizarro World no longer existed. The Daxamite Kryptonians would no longer factor into Superman's life at all. Supergirl was now a shape-shifting automaton, and Green was the only kryptonite isotope in existence. Burns makeover was meant to make Superman more relatable. In other words, more Marvel Comics. Superman initially regards his powers as a curse, even thinks he might be a mutant. The Kents were essentially Aunt May and Uncle Ben. Lex was basically Wilson Fisk. Supergirl was an in-name-only legacy character, like Marvel's in-name-only legacy characters. Superman even filmed a porno like Karen Page. <laughs> yep, that happened. Although commercially successful, there were flaws. The new canon, not the porno. How does one isotope of kryptonite make Superman less powerful? How do powers ruin his personal life when he maintains old and new friends and still excels at his job? How is Clark Kent no longer being a hot mess make him more relatable with awkward comic nerds? And how does a lower power limit make Superman more vulnerable when that rule is constantly ignored? The burn makeover would have been the new standard for the character if it had been the only Superman across all media. Although Burn Superman would be adapted into the Ruby Spears cartoon in Lois and Clark, the cartoon lasted only one season and would remain unseen for three decades, while Lois and Clark was a forgettable dramedy. Meanwhile, adaptations of the pre-Burn Superman remained popular. The Christopher Reeve portrayal was considered the perfect performance of the character. The Adventures of Superboy was a successful syndicated TV series, and Super Friends found a new life in syndication on the Cartoon Network. But what about Superman the Animated Series? Superman the Animated Series was a mixture of Burns' makeover and new material. Unlike Batman the Animated Series, which frequently adapted classic tales, Superman the Animated Series didn't. In interviews and commentaries, producers would mention several edicts that prevented more accurate adaptations of classic elements. These edicts were meant to ensure a consistent branding of Burns Superman. The series adapted to the edicts with bland results. The Legion was only barely part of Superman's mythos. Supergirl was now Kara in Z, an Argosian from Krypton's sister planet of Argos. There were only two Kryptonian criminals. Neither were Zod, Ursa, or Non. The Fortress of Solitude was now a discount Batcave. A pattern began to emerge during this time. The comics and adaptations no longer shared the same amount of DNA as they previously did. How pathetic is it that the Super Friends more consistently adapted the Superman mythos of the Silver and Bronze Age than any modern adaptation has done with the post-burn material? Smallville, Legion of Superheroes, Brian Singer, The Arrowverse, and the DCEU wildly vary regarding the vital details while Marvel can tell new stories across all media while maintaining a baseline consistency, DC can't. This is especially frustrating in regards to DC's flagship hero. You might feed a fan a Superman sandwich on Smallville bread, but not Lois and Clark or 
DCEU bread. Well, at least the comics finally, finally found consistency. Why do I even ask? Dan Didio became editor-in-chief at DC in 2001. He was an older fan, having grown up with the Silver and Bronze Age DC. And then one day, he visited Six Flags to ride a Superman roller coaster. There, he read the official bios of the Superman characters. One in particular stood out to him. Supergirl's bio described her as an ectoplasmic being bonded to an angel. Didio experienced cognitive static at that point. To paraphrase Jim Carrey in The Mask, it was time for an overhaul. By 2001, the inconsistency of the Superman brand across decades adaptations and comics had spiraled into a black hole of WTF moments. Supergirl was a shape-shifting, telekinetic robot who bonded with a human soul and became an angel. Superboy was now a hybrid of Superman and Lex Luthor, whose power was a telekinesis that activated only by touching things. Huh? Superman now had many fortresses of solitude around the globe. Superman became an energy being, and then split into Superman Blue and Superman Red. Kandor was no longer a Kryptonian city shrunk by Brainiac, but an alien Babylon created by a wizard. Brainiac was a carnival mentalist possessed by a computerized something or other. There was even a Superman action figure packaged with kryptonite blasting weapons. That's right. Superman was now exposing himself to his most fatal weakness in order to blast bad guys. This figure should have been called Darwin Award Superman. Didio would attempt to unify the broken brand across as much media as possible. He began with the comics, of course. Supergirl would be reintroduced as Superman's biological cousin. Kandor was again a shrunken Kryptonian city. The Phantom Zone was again the prison for Zod, Ursa, and Non. Bizarro World was back. The Fortress of Solitude was now based on the one widely seen in the classic films. Superman once again began as Superboy, and once again, a Legion member. But then, Didio ordered a reboot in 2011. This reboot returned Superman to his social justice roots, but with a t-shirt and jeans look based on Bruce Springsteen. It was during this reboot that Superman would go on to wear a ceremonial armor once worn by Kryptonian warrior diplomats. This Superman was brash, outspoken, and reckless. Worse, his marriage to Lois Lane, which was popular, was now erased from canon. Furthermore, Didio began to emphasize a god metaphor for the character. The problem with marketing a metaphor is consumers take it literally and it backfires. This new portrayal was heavily promoted with its image being splashed on merchandise and across all media. This Superman went up, up and away, only to land with a resounding thud. Didio alienated writers, repelled fans, and created more inconsistency. Poor sales forced Didio to course correct. Rebirth was a patch job and a resounding success. Superman was now a father to a new Superboy. However, Didio ended this popular status quo and then published a grim, dark version of Superman's backstory as a new definitive origin. Furthermore, Superman's son would become a teenager sharing the Superman name with dear old dad. This teenage Superman would be a queer character. Nothing wrong with that. Yet, by sharing a name, fans and non-fans alike confused the two. Mistaking the straight Superman to be queer was to lack awareness of and visibility for his queer son, thereby making his son undergo queer erasure. Didio would be escorted from the DC offices in early 2020. So, how do you write a character so convoluted, confusing, and downright broken as Superman? How to write Superman. Genre. Science fantasy is a genre wherein reality is built to be scientifically logical, but not scientifically accurate, like dramedy and sci-spy. Science fantasy is a mixed genre. Physical laws can be stretched to behave almost supernaturally. Star Wars, Ghostbusters, and of course, John Carter are fine examples. Powers. On Krypton, Superman's people lacked powers due to having evolved under a red sun. Kryptonians get charged up like a solar battery when under a yellow sun. 
However, this charge is indeed finite. When not bathed by a yellow sun, Superman's powers will fade. His powers are outright cancelled when soaking up red sunlight. One Super Friends episode depicted Superman as being partially weakened under an orange sun. The story Escape from Bizarro World depicted Superman as gaining the ability to transmit his powers to others when bathed in blue sunlight. I dislike this particular ability due to Superman's alien body suddenly behaving like a magic machine. This ability illustrates just indeed how tricky it is to write science fantasy. We now interrupt this video for an important announcement. Gravity. If you've read the Superman comics, especially the modern comics, the classic adaptations and the source books, you would know that yellow sunlight is indeed his power source. Even when writers and editors have paid homage to gravity as the golden age Superman powers source, it's been of no impact on how modern Superman's powers actually work. Sorry, Owen likes comics. Yellow sunlight is not a power boost, but indeed his only actual power source. When writing Superman, just defy gravity. And here are the following reasons why. 1. Official sources ignore it or make it of no actual importance. 2. Science fantasy demands acknowledgement of the limits of physical forces. 3. Earth's lower gravity does not explain actual flight, changes in flight speed, and changes in aerial direction. 4. If a higher gravity world explains Superman's strength, then that strength would atrophy over time. And why does he not bounce when walking around? 5. If Earth's gravity is the cause of Superman's flight and strength, then those abilities would be physical abilities and traits, not actual powers. 6. If Earth's gravity causes any of Superman's powers, then why do they disappear when Superman is deprived of yellow sunlight? When you write Superman, just defy gravity, okay? Now back to our regularly scheduled video. Superman's powers should be heat vision, x-ray vision, telescopic vision, hearing, invulnerability, strength, speed, freeze breath, and of course, flight. Among these powers, the trickiest ones to depict are strength, speed, hearing, and flight. Although many a writer have sought to place limits and strict rules on these abilities, others have completely ignored such discipline. Rule of thumb, Superman should not lift and carry more weight than what a crawler transporter can. That would be between 5,400 and 8,200 tons. More powerful than a locomotive indeed. As for invulnerability, he can easily shrug off a yield of up to 5 kilotons of TNT. As for that quirky freeze breath, his lungs should behave like oxygen tanks. He can store supplemental oxygen in his lungs, and once released, that breath freezes. Of course, he can store and release a lot. By doing so, of course, his breath will cool and, well, freeze. Weaknesses you know, someone once suggested to me that Superman needed a kryptonite. I said, kryptonite? That person then said, yes, you know, kryptonite, it means weakness. That's what Superman needs, a weakness. I then explained to him that the word kryptonite comes from the name of Superman's most famous weakness. The conversation then spiraled into a dialogue on par with Abbott and Costello's Who's On First gag. You have to exposit Superman the way you would exposit a vampire or a werewolf. That is, you have to state the rules of powers and weaknesses up front. I guess we'll start with kryptonite then. Kryptonite is a radioactive metallic fragment of Superman's doomed home world. Impurities in this metallic ore forges several isotopes. The most famous isotopes include green, red, gold, blue, black, and silver. These isotopes vary across canon. However, I'll focus on the most famous and consistent versions. Green poisons Superman's body. On Smallville, green mutates non-Kryptonians into super beings. On Smallville, red lowers Superman's inhibitions. In classic comics, red causes random mutations in Kryptonians. Depending on canon, gold either permanently or temporarily deprives Superman of his powers. Blue poisons Bizarro and heals Superman. On Smallville, blue behaves like gold. In film, comics, and TV, black splits or copies beings and objects. Silver makes Superman experience paranoid delusions. Since mind and body themes are common across Superman canon, I would keep kryptonite simple like that. 
Green poisons the body, red lowers inhibitions, gold suspends his powers, blue poisons Bizarro but heals Superman, black should cause dissociate identity disorder, and silver should cause paranoid delusions, and since I have a soft spot for it, jeweled kryptonite causes mutations, I mean, it's jeweled, it has varying jewels in it. It's often depicted that kryptonite only affects Superman when it's been charged up with yellow sunlight. I speculate the kryptonite radiation taints the yellow sunlight in his system, causing these adverse reactions. Without the charge, the kryptonite might not affect them. Although classified as a yellow dwarf, Earth sunlight is actually white, but with science fantasy, you can work with either color. Maybe kryptonians conflate white and yellow somehow. Krypton orbited a red sun. Scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson suggested Krypton should orbit red dwarf LHS 2520. However, most canon depicts Krypton's sun, Ra'o, as a red giant. Either can work in science fantasy, if not in science fact. Under a red sun, Kryptonians lack powers. Therefore, red sunlight, once absorbed by Superman, renders him powerless. Depending on intensity, red sunlight should burn the Man of Steel. It wouldn't be science fantasy without the fantasy. Magic is another weakness for Superman. Simply put, magic don't give a I would go as far to say proximity to magic either weakens or negates his powers. And then there's mind control. Superman's susceptibility to mind control is inconsistent throughout modern comics. However, in classic comments, there was a reoccurrence of Superman being mind controlled or easily rendered unconscious. Marvel Squadron Supreme, whose leader is a Superman parody, often lampoons this. Since Superman is the epitome of physicality, I would include a vulnerability to mental attacks. And then there's the infamous Super Flare. This ability is when Superman purges the yellow sunlight from his body. This renders him powerless. I would advise never including Super Flare, either as a power or as a weakness. And here's why. One. It renders his struggle living among us as a non-issue. Two, as a power, it can only be used violently. Three, if you can shut off your powers whenever, then you really are overpowered. Relatability. Modern comics suggest Kryptonians are hardwired to possess enhanced empathy while young and overconfidence while older. I would argue against using this particular factoid when writing Superman. While his powers are caused by the natural world, his empathy is the result of a nurturing environment. Sure, his powers can render many tasks too easy, and he can take such ease for granted. That overconfidence can happen to anyone. It should not be the cause for hardwiring, nor should empathy. Morality is a learning experience of teachable moments, and Superman's best moments are all about moral arguments and dilemmas. Now, is Superman a perfect person? No. But anyone who chooses empathy and altruism over callousness and selfishness might appear that way. I think Superman is someone who found healthy solutions to an otherwise unhealthy situation. He is, after all, an alien who grew up passing for a human while dealing with powers caused by the color of the sun and whose affliction is colorful rocks. I imagine Superman grew up feeling like the Little Mermaid, wanting to be part of our world. So, what sort of person is Superman? Allegory Superman is a collection of allegories, and allegories have always produced the finest Superman tales. So, it goes to reason that Superman ought to emphasize the power of allegory. Rather than Jesus or Moses, Superman is more of a Samson. He has a weakness. He is the protector of a community. Superman sees himself in a communal sense. Superman is the story of a refugee. He's from another land, destroyed by environmental causes. He was taken in by travelers who found him stranded. As a refugee, Superman is grateful, wants to give back, but does not believe his sanctuary, his oasis, is perfect. He doesn't want Earth to end up like Krypton, a doomed world with no friends in its hour of need. Clark Kent is the story of a special needs child. Let me elaborate. Children with special needs aren't sent to special parents. They make parents special. Superman has often been criticized for being too perfect. 
without consideration for his upbringing. The Kens kept it simple. Clark had special needs. Superman was raised to be empathetic and careful. The Kents raised him to practice empathy. Clark is a small town boy with big city dreams. Small towns can be rather unforgiving yet in awe of those who make it big. Is Clark a pariah, a celebrity, or someone just deeply missed by his neighbors? I have no particular answer. So when you write Superman, feel free to choose one. There's the allegory of passing within Superman. For some, this allegory of the crypto Jew, the family secret, or the closet case. Regardless, when writing Superman's youth, there has to be a fear of being exposed. You might notice that in real life, exposure means rejection and ostracism. There's a reason Superman refers to watching films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind and E.T. and not Invasion of the Body Snatchers or War of the Worlds. Clark was bullied, being apart for his own protection and the protection of others, put him in a vulnerable situation. When Batman battles psychological archetypes and Spider-Man battles dark reflections of himself, Superman battles bullies, Lex Luthor, Darkseid, Brainiac, Mr. Mix's Pitalik, Steve Lombard, etc. Lex is the snob bully, Darkseid is the dictator bully, Brainiac is the intellectual bully, Mr. Mix's Pitalik, the flaunting bully. Clark Kent, by contrast, is the nerd, the son of poor farmers, the insecure and modest outsider. Oh, and Steve Lombard, he's a jock. Remember, a bullying allegory serves to highlight another aspect of Superman's mythos. That is, the conflict between the haves and the have-nots. Clark grew up without money, political power, and economic influence so he's very suspicious and uncomfortable around such people. This might be what set him apart from many of his fellow Justice Leaguers. He's not rich like Batman, and not royalty like Wonder Woman and Aquaman. Personality. Many say Superman is a non-character. I disagree. I think he's two characters. Before we continue, I'd like to give a shout out to Jessie Gender and her amazing video on Captain Christopher Pike from which I'll be cribbing. Thank you, Jesse, for giving permission. The link's in the description below. Now, on with the video. Anson Mount's portrayal has garnered praise for both Pike's aspirational humanity and sincere relatability. When I watch Christopher Pike, I cannot help but see Superman. For starters, he brings people in. He's very personable with appropriate distance. He's generous with his time, welcomes sharing, and believes he must earn trust each and every day. Pike and Superman have private doubts and fears, but get through those worries with humor, positivity, and familiarity. No wonder they both remember names, not because of some hardwired, edetic memory, but because of values. And they each believe that knowing others means we can make them better, and ourselves as well. They deal with who they can see, not their reputation, they each ask the question, who are you now? Such values mean Pike and Superman both express visible awe at the respective worlds they inhabit and the many worlds they each visit. This is why both characters delight in diversity of thought, people, and opinion. For Pike, such delight is enabled through being a leader. For Superman, that delight is enabled through being a reporter. To sacrifice those values mean the never-ending battle for truth and justice is lost before it's fought. All that being said, action is the expression of direction, decisiveness, and solutions for both characters. One such action is the act of admitting mistakes. For example, when Pike admitted that Section 31, the Black Ops team of Starfleet, must navigate a gray area, it was like Superman admitting that Batman likewise must walk a different path than him. Additionally, the act of vulnerability is an important trait of Pike, as it is with Superman. When writing Superman, remember, when Pike shares his faith in humanity, wearing such faith on his sleeve in order to open himself to possibility, this enables Pike to stand, not for himself, but for everyone else by acting on service, sacrifice, passion, and love. These are important values to remember when motivating Superman. Finally, when writing Superman, remember that the Man of Steel, like Christopher Pike, 
believes that dreams save us, make us better, and lift us up, transforming us into someone better. Pike allows himself to be vulnerable. He shares his faith in humanity at all times. He opens himself up to others. He wears his faith on his faith. Pike, like Superman, models humanity at our best. The second character who can serve as a model for writing Superman is Sam Beckett of Quantum Leap. Although programmed with martial arts, Sam's most powerful trait is his empathy. Sam knows he lacks all of the answers when walking in another's life. However, he relies on basic empathy to elicit change in others. Rarely was a petty prejudice, a selfish vengeance, a self-righteous anger, or personal gain ever Sam's motivations to help others. Sam genuinely cares about people. Sam's brother perished in Vietnam as a statistic, a small cog in a war machine. But to Sam, his brother mattered. And in Sam's leaps, that means others matter as well. It's while leaping, Sam makes us, the audience, know that everyone, no matter how ordinary, matters. Just like how Superman sees that everyone matters. Those helped by Sam go on to make a better life that no doubt will positively affect others. Sam knows that everyone is deserving of basic human respect, decency, and kindness. Sam has the power to alter time, but he uses that power altruistically. Sam looks at the world simply. He's simply a friend. What people need most, not a strong man, not a vigilant force, the American way is lending a helping hand, such as Sam Beckett and such as Superman. That genuine love of people, although Sam is forced to make contact with people due to leaping, he would help others regardless. And that is how you write Superman. I hope I've been clear as mud. How would you write The Man of Steel? Wax literary in the comments below. I am Jack Ryder, and I'm out.